Hi everyone, welcome to week three of Start Your Own Product. Um, this week I'm going to be going through digital fabrication design processes. Um, so really I'm going to be talking about the kind of tools, the kind of hardware and software tools that uh, we have available in the Fab Lab. And um, sort of basically talk about, you know, how to get your design onto a computer and then from the computer into some kind of a physical form, physical kind of prototype. So let's just define some terms. When we're talking about digital fabrication terms, <clears throat> there's quite a lot of kind of jargon. I just want to try and demystify that jargon in terms of like what subtractive manufacturing, additive manufacturing, rapid prototyping, all these, all these kind of buzzwords, um, what they actually all mean. Um, Another thing that we need to kind of um, try and define as well is the kind of data types and data files that um, that you'll see when you're using these applications. So if you're using sort of CAD and if you're using sort of two D um, graphic applications, um, there's lots of um, different types of file types. Um, SVG, EPS, PDF, they're all kind of for two D graphics. And they kind of define um, what we would call vector graphics. Um, now, vector graphics are the kind of two um, D graphics that we use for digital fabrication because they kind of describe um, shapes as kind of mathematical formulas, which lend themselves easily to being um, converted into data that a, a machine will understand. Um, other types of file formats that we might see are in the 3D side of things. So DXF is um, a proprietary format. Um, so that was created by Autodesk, um, who do AutoCAD. Um, so they, they own that file type, but it has become, I guess, kind of a de facto standard for, for 3D and 2D um, CAD drawings um, and models. And then moving down, you have STEP, which is kind of an open standard um, that allows you to sort of exchange data between different kind of CAD programs. Um, OBJ is another kind of proprietary 3D graphics format. Um, and then the last one, STL. STL is one of the most sort of common open standards used for, for 3D printing. Um, and it kind of describes the surface data of a 3D model. Um, so it's kind of basic format, but it does allow you to move kind of data from one application to another quite easily. So they're the, in general terms, the type, types of files that we might see when we're, we're going through. And I can show you, I'm gonna show you some demos later on of um, uh, some applications and we'll be using those types of files. So, Subtractive manufacturing. <clears throat> so basically, subtractive manufacturing is, is any type of manufacturing um, with a with a machine where you start off with a lump of raw material, be that a you know a sheet of wood or a, a block of um, marble or a block of metal or or something, and you cut away what you don't need to leave behind what you do need. So you're subtracting um, material from a from a from a block or a sheet to leave behind the part that you want. Now, subtracting manufacturing in that respect is quite wasteful because you're left behind with all this waste stuff that you don't need. Now, often you can maybe recycle that, but quite often the actual manufacturing processes itself um, mean that the the material left behind cannot be reused. So um, subtractive manufacturing um, is very good for certain things, but in terms of sort of, you know, sustainability, um, you do end up with quite a bit of waste. So the sort of four types of machines that we that we would have and use in, in the Fab Lab, the subtractive machines are um, CNC router. So what does CNC stand for? Let's define this term as well. So CNC means computer numeric control. So basically what that what that means is um, 
any any machine that can be controlled by a computer using code is a CNC machine. Um, so we have there a, a CNC router, um, this machine here. Um, basically, that just takes an ordinary kind of like um, router head and mounts it on a, on a gantry that can move up and down um, and left to right and um, backwards and forwards, really. So you, when you're talking about CNC machines, you usually talk about the number of axes they have. So for something like this machine here, um, the CNC router, it's it's a three axis machine. It can go in a X and a Y and a Z. So it can move backwards and forwards, side to side and up and down. So that's be a three axis CNC router. Um, this over here next to that, the Roland um, is a CNC mill. Um, Again, very similar. It's just got a, a cutting head there that uses essentially kind of like a drill bit. Um, but this uses much finer precision um, bits on it so that you can do much kind of finer work. The CNC router would be used to kind of, you know, cut large, you know, sheet material like um, plywood, maybe up to about 20 millimeters. Whereas a CNC mill, would be used to um, maybe kind of like cut, say, machining wax to create, you know, molds for jewelry. And the other thing that the CNC mill is is very good for is um, actually cutting the tracks on printed circuit boards. So you can actually make um, printed circuit boards from the CNC mill because it's it's very accurate. You can get that fine detail. The other machine then. Uh, is the laser cutter and this picture here is actually the laser cutter I have in, in the room with me at the moment and we'll be using that a bit later on for, for a project. Um, so a laser cutter has a, um, a high powered laser tube in it and it basically burns through um, whatever you know material you put on the, the laser cutter bed um, and, and can cut out shapes. It can also, if you sort of turn the power down it can engrave into that material um, the cnc router and the cnc mill can also kind of like engrave but they set effectively they're, they're kind of like um cutting away in sort of like relief um the surface that they're that they're working on the actual laser cutter itself will um will kind of engrave into the the surface so say for instance you can put um say glass or acrylic into um into the laser cutter and you can in engrave onto that and it, it creates um just a kind of very fine surface engraving the last machine we have is a, a vinyl cutter a vinyl cutter takes um these rolls of of sheet plastic so it, if um if you remember back to your school days you may remember covering your your school books in uh, in sticky back plastic or clear contact as it's sometimes called um the vinyl cutter takes rolls of, of kind of plastic like that and it has a a effectively a, a craft knife in there but it's on a it's on a special 360 degree head so the blade can kind of spin around um it then um can take um, sheet material which goes in and rolls backwards and forwards so again you have your 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 x and your y and then the blade lifts up and down to cut out the shapes so the vinyl cutter is useful for you know creating signage um, and even for creating um, uh, special fabric vinyl which which allows you to heat press it onto onto material and create t-shirts and, and and bags and things like that um, down the bottom here I've got other cutting tools are available there are there are quite a lot more um, CNC um, machines there's things like water jet cutters that use like a high power jet of water um, to cut through say sheets sheet metal um or even 
thick sheets of glass so you can actually sort of uh, cut out shapes into glass um there are things like um plasma cutters which are kind of similar to laser cutters which again can cut through very thick materials so any any kind of like um machine that has some kind of a cutting cutting tool on it um will come under the kind of subtractive manufacturing um so just diving into a bit deeper into into that like just to reiterate cnc routing typically used for large sheet materials and it goes from desktop machines all the way up to very large industrial machines now there's some links there in the presentation that you can click on and uh, and have a look at um i won't go on to them now just to save a bit of time um cnc milling like we're saying typically used more for precision work and the thing about the cnc mill is um it can have extra axes on it so you know we spoke about having three axes which is x y and z so sort of left to right back and forwards and up and down um so what would be like the the extra axes here the, the fourth and fifth and sixth axes those are kind of like rotational axes and those machines look more like um robotic arms and uh, they can um, they can actually kind of do kind of carving work and go you know 360 degrees around an object to kind of carve out things. Uh, again, there's some links there showing you some um, some CNC milling things. And I'm just going to show a quick demo video of a of a of a kind of desktop CNC machine in action. This is a shop bot desktop CNC machine. So I'm just going to switch over to um, to that now and, and play the video. So bear with me one second while we line this up. Okay, here we go. Ah, actually, hang on a sec. Let's make sure that we're actually hearing that properly. I'm not sure if we are. Let's try that one more time. Okay, here we go. Skills. In this series, we'll walk you through using a ShopBot desktop to make every size of Apple Box. We'll start with the eight inch Apple Box full and work our way down, introducing new concepts as we go. For material, we're gonna use plywood scraps at different thicknesses. We'll start by making the top and the bottom using half inch ply. Now, in actuality, the sheet is giving the average thickness readings of 0.48 inches thick. Next, we fire up the Vector CAD software that comes with the ShopBot. We create a new drawing file and get this job setup window. And by default, I've got the job size set to 24 by 18 inches, which corresponds with the machine's bed size. Under material, we'll enter the material's thickness and indicate whether we're going to zero the bit to the top or the bottom of the material. That way the machine knows precisely how deep to plunge the bit. In this case, we're zeroing to the bottom of the material, which is to say the top of the spoil board. XY datum position has our zero zero set to the lower left corner, that's fine. And for units, we'll stick with inches. Now we draw the parts up. Vectric's got some great tutorials on the website for how to use all of the program's drawing tools, so we won't double up on that here. To cut our pieces out, we'll use a quarter inch upcut spiral bid. And don't worry, in later videos, we'll get into why you choose certain bits for certain applications. Here, I install and zero the bit as demonstrated in an earlier video. Next, we mount our workpiece. Now with CNC milling, holding the work down securely is crucial because we have a bit that's spinning at thousands of RPMs and plunging into the material. The most basic hold down method is to simply screw your piece into the spoil board. Here I'm using some self-tapping Craig screws. And of course, we ensure our screws are located such that the bit is not going to run into them. This is where the spoil board grid comes in handy. Now we'll set up the tool path in the drawing file. To do this, we select the outline of our part and choose what's called a profile toolpath. That simply means the bit will travel along that outline that we selected. We can choose to have the bit cut inside the lines, outside of the lines, or directly on the lines. In this case, we're going to be cutting outside of the lines. 
Then we tell the machine which bit we're using by selecting it from the tool database built into the software. And we set the cutting depth. Finally, we name our toolpath, then hit Calculate. The software lets you preview the cut you're about to make. Now, here's the thing. We just talked about the importance of hold down, and we can see here in this preview that once this piece is cut out of the middle of our material, there's nothing holding it to the machine's bed. And if that piece moves as it's being cut free, it could jam the bit up, or if it was a smaller piece, the bit might pick it up and shoot it around. Obviously, we don't want that. That's why there's this tabs feature built into the software. We can choose to add tabs to the toolpath and place them wherever we'd like them. Now let's recalculate the toolpath and preview it again. So here we can see we've got our part surrounded by enough of these tabs to hold it in place during the machining operation. So now it's go time. We set the spindle to the correct speed for cutting this material. Then we export the toolpath into a cutting file that the machine can read, and we advance through these dialog boxes to give the machine the OK. And it cuts the part out. I've left the dust foot off here for visual clarity. Had we left the dust foot on, there wouldn't be nearly this much sawdust and chips. Here I'll vacuum them out so that you can see better. Now we can see it's cut out everything except the tabs. But these top edges are still square, and what we want in a finished apple box are rounded edges. So next, we'll switch to a point roundover bit. This time, it's more convenient to zero the z-axis to the top of the material, since the workpiece is already mounted. So that's what we're going to do. And we'll be sure to change that zeroing indication in the drawing file itself. Creating the cutting file for the roundover is similar to the first one we did. We select that same outline in the drawing and then click on the Profile toolpath. However, this time we want the bit to cut directly on the line we've drawn, not to the outside of it. And of course, we have to tell the machine that we've changed the bit, so we select it from the bit database. In this case, we're using a bit with a 1 8 inch radius. Lastly, we need to set our desired depth of cut. Then we name our toolpath, hit Calculate, and preview the cut to be sure it's giving us what we want. This looks pretty good. The spindle speed required for this bit is identical to the last bits, so we can leave that be. Now we export our new cutting file to the machine and let the machine do its thing. Next, we remove the mounting screws. Now, our piece is still held in place with these tabs. But to break the part out, I've seen people use a utility knife, a chisel, or a saw. I use pruning shears. To get rid of the tabs altogether, most folks use a sanding machine. I don't have one, so I'll just knock the tabs down with a file. And there we have the finished top. OK, so there we go. Um giving you a, a, an overview on um, CNC routing and how to set up a file in the software there. Okay, I'm just gonna switch back to the uh, presentation. Give me one second. Okay, um, so laser cutters is the next thing to talk about. Um, a laser cutter, it basically has a focused laser beam and the term is to ablate which means to burn material under computer control um, so there's three main types of laser um, machine that you'll you'll kind of see um, and kind of increasing in power and wattage you have the diode lasers which is this kind of like um, diy laser down here somebody actually took two um two mechanisms from 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 old cd <laughs> drives and made their own uh, laser engraver using a, a, a diode laser. Diode lasers are the lasers that you see in kind of laser pointers. Um, and the laser pointers are very, very low power. But you can get la diode lasers that go up to, a, you know, go up to about eight watts. Um, and they're, uh, they're, they're kind of powerful enough to do some damage. Um, so, um, they certainly wouldn't be be used as a as a laser pointer, but um, 
you can certainly engrave with them. You wouldn't really be able to cut very much with them, but you can certainly uh, use them to engraving. And quite a lot of um, sort of uh, high, high, well, high end, but sort of, you know, um, professional laser engravers may use a diode laser because they're, they, they can actually give quite a narrow beam and give quite accurate uh, engraving. Um, the next type of laser is a CO2 laser. That's the one in the middle there, the laser stripped. That, that's actually our old laser cutter in the Fab Lab. Um, so this uses a, 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 a laser tube. Um, it looks very much like um, either like a neon tube or like a halogen tube bulb. Um, and it's filled with CO2 gas. And it's that that, that excites the, um, the laser beam and generates, generates the the, the the laser light which then gets bounced around a series of mirrors and then focused down onto the laser bed now those come the wattage of those kind of starts around sort of like 30 watts and kind of goes up to maybe sort of like 150 200 watts um and certainly like uh, the laser cutter we have here is a 45 watt laser and that can easily cut through sort of um five or six mil uh, acrylic or plywood um, and then increasing in power, you've got fiber lasers. Um, they use um, fiber optic, um, uh, uh, basically fiber optic um, sort of uh, tubes to um, to create the, the laser light. And uh, those ones can come up to sort of kilowatts of power. And and, and those those the fiber lasers um, are actually able to um, cut through you know sort of mild steel you know maybe a, a maybe like five or ten millimeter thick mild steel so they're very powerful um the smaller ones the co2 lasers and the diode lasers like i'm saying they, they they can't really well the co2 lasers can't cut through metal at all but they can engrave on metal um and certainly the diode lasers you know you'd really only use them for, for engraving. Um, so like I was saying, laser cutters come from sort of like, you know, mini size to mega size. Um, and um, there's a few links there um, that are quite interesting um, ways of kind of using laser cutters and the sort of like tips and tricks. Again, I'm just gonna show you a quick video um, of a laser cutter in action. This is a laser cutter called a Flux Beam Box. Uh, which is a new laser cutter that was uh, launched on Kickstarter last year. Uh, it's just going to show you, you know, the laser cutter cutting through and engraving, you know, a few different types of material. Um, so I'll just switch over to that and show you that. Give me one second. Okay, here we go. I don't think there's any audio on this one. Um, so we'll just play this one. Um, so obviously these videos are sped up. Laser engraving um, actually is quite a slow process um, because when it engraves, it has to actually do each line of engraving at once you see it goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards it's uh, it's engraving onto glass there um and laser cutting obviously doesn't need to um go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards uh, it can follow the path for whatever it wants to cut um so laser cutting is much quicker than laser engraving um, i kind of think of laser engraving as like an old um, dot matrix printer because essentially it's 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 using um, using the laser head to sort of burn tiny little dots as it goes across as you see there it's engraving into leather so laser engravers can can engrave onto um, quite a lot of materials and can cut through you know quite a lot of materials Okay, there we go. That's that one. We'll cancel that. Okay, I'll switch back to the, uh, the presentation. Give me one sec. Um, 
so vinyl cutter well a vinyl cutter is a computer controlled 360 degree rotation cutting blade so like i was saying um the the vinyl cutter has this is actually our own vinyl cutter here the picture here um the vinyl cutter has a very small blade it's you know very very tiny blade but it's very kind of sharp and it's on a swivel head so it can as the blade moves it kind of swivels around um variants of this are sometimes called cutting plotters because you can actually replace the bl the blade with a pen and use them to to draw, you know technical drawings um, we can actually do that with our um vinyl cutter here um so typical uses for vinyl cutters are like i was saying you know use them for sign making uh, making stencils um like say t-shirts you know doing screen printing um work um where you cut out the vinyl and stick it onto uh the screen to you know put the inks through um the other thing you can be also used for is you can put um paper into their sort of thin card and use it for paper prototyping so again i'm just going to show you a quick video here of a designer in the states that uses a, a vinyl cutter um for for paper prototyping so let's just switch over to that and share that. Okay, here we go. I'm Joe Bowers. I'm an industrial designer for the Well Collective. What inspires me as an industrial designer is curiosity. The parts of design that appeal to me are just tinkering designers and myself included. Let's see if we can't get them to work better. New tools and new capabilities end up leading to different results. When I found the silhouette, I ended up just drowning in the potential. I'm constantly frustrated that I'm only scratching the surface of the capability of the tool. The silhouette is something that I use almost daily. The first week that we had the silhouette in our studio at my job, a uh, factory had made a mistake. We're running tight on a deadline. We needed to have a final product of the headphone piece that we were working on at a trade show booth. And 3D printing wasn't really an option in this situation. We didn't have three hours, we had 30 minutes. I took the CAD model, I unfolded it, I sent it to the silhouette, it cut it out for me and I taped it up and all of a sudden I had a real prototype of our design intent. And we were able to take that size and make some judgments really quickly and within 30 minutes we had our answer. Something I really enjoyed platonic solids or complex geodesic surfaces. And I'll cat it up, um, unfold it, and then have it cut out by the Cameo and then assemble it. And I learn a lot about geometry. The question I keep asking is how do you make a bowl out of paper? You know, it's a concave surface. It means that the paper has to bend in two directions. I have really enjoyed playing with taking paper and trying to give it properties that it doesn't have naturally. And the silhouette's just the best way to quickly iterate that. It really just comes down to precision. I never want to trust my own hands again. I mean, the benefit that designers can really appreciate when using this machine or even makers is knowing that it's going to be accurate, knowing that it's going to save you time and knowing that you're going to get something in your hands really quickly. What I do is I take my sketch concept and then I create a 3D model of that concept on my computer in a CAD program. And then I can use my CAD program to actually unfold them into a flat drawing. And I can take that flat drawing and use Silhouette Studio to tell my Cameo to cut that flat model out. And then I can just assemble it myself. When Brock, the founder of Gold Coast, approached me and talked about getting together and collaborating on some skateboard trucks, I brought up to him the idea of using paper as a unique process that might yield different results. Brock really liked that idea. So my name is Brock Harris. I'm one of the co-founders of Gold Coast Skateboards. We've uh, branded ourselves as the design leader in skateboards. My job title is uh, director of product. So I'm in charge of all the skateboard physical attributes. With our factories overseas, it's very expensive with shipping and sample fees. I'd rather bring things in-house do the prototyping here, figure things out, you know, within a day, pull the trigger, then go to production. The silhouette that could a rapid prototype, cut it out on vinyl or paper, lay it over one of our concave molds, and then take it downstairs to the wood shop and be able to cut that out is extremely tantalizing. 
so we actually approached a project on trucks and the truck ended up being, you know, very planar, very angular and a different truck than you've ever seen. Glasses are really a lot about the curve, about the thicks, the thins. It just doesn't translate on the screen if it's going to fit a face. If I were waiting for a factory to create sales samples, it would take weeks in between each design iteration. But during this project, I could do an outline and then I could print them out and actually see how it fit my face. Almost as soon as I had thought of a different design, I had them in my hands. And then once I had something that I wanted to go with, I could create a 3D model of it and get more physical. For any maker or a designer that wants an accessible means of prototyping or modeling on their own, there's really no good excuse for not having a Silhouette Cameo. That's a good advertisement for Silhouette. Um, Silhouette are another um, vinyl cutter manufacturer. Um, I'll just switch back to the presentation. Okay, so um, I'm going to try and do a demo for you um, of, of of laser cutting. Um, so I'm going to use a program called Inkscape and create just a very simple kind of box. Um, I'm going to make a little kind of say money box. Um, and then create that, bring that into Inkscape, do a bit of modification with it, and then send it across to our, our laser cutter and actually physically cut it out here. I'm gonna use a bit of uh, three mil plywood, um, sheet of plywood here that I have and create a little um, uh, box. So let's jump into this. First of all, I'm going to need to go to the screen here and show you. So this is a website called Maker Case. Um, Maker Case lets you um, basically generate designs for boxes online and then download those plans um, as either SVG or DXF files. Uh, remember, we spoke about those earlier. So what I'm going to do is uh, select a basic box. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to select the millimeters as my unit, and I'm going to tell it that I want it to be, say, 80 millimeters wide by 60 millimeters high, 80 millimeters deep. So there's my there's my box. I can have a little bit of a preview of it. Um, I need to tell it whether that's the inside or the outside dimension. So actually, I want that to be the inside dimensions. And I need to tell it what the thickness of my, my, my material is. Um, three, six, nine, or 12. Well, it's three mil plywood I have. So just going to leave it as three mil. Um, whether I want it to, you know, have a lid, be an open box or a closed box. So I'm going to have it as a tiny box. And then the different types of joints I can have. So if it's if I were going to glue it together, say um, just flat joints. Um, if I'm laser cutting, I can actually use uh, what's called finger joints there, which is kind of where it cuts out a kind of like a, a, a grid pattern on the side. Um, the other type of joints I could have is what's called T slots. So where it cuts out little slots where I could put screws in to hold it together. I'm going to use select finger joints here, and I'm just going to select the size of the finger joints to say be, um, let's see, say 10 and a half. That should be enough to uh, fit it together, I'd say. That should be good. Yeah, that'll be good. Um, and then if I come down here, I can download the box plans. Um, so it gives me a preview of, of, of what all the parts will be like. I can um, have the panels labeled for me so they know what they are. Um, certain um, applications like you to have the lines in various colors so they can determine which lines need to be cut. That's not so important for us. And then the next thing that, it's, that we can set is what's called kerf and corner compensation. So, this is important for dealing with subtractive manufacturing machines. Any subtractive manufacturing machine that cuts through something will effectively cut away a part of the material. So if you if you think about the uh, 
the CNC video we saw, um, it was cutting out the, the top lid of that box that they were making. And, um, and it was leaving quite a, a wide channel. That is what's called the kerf. Whatever is sort of cut away from um, a sheet material is what's called the kerf. So obviously on a CNC machine, that kerf can be quite wide. On something like the laser cutter, because it's quite a focused narrow beam, you know, it's quite quite a small amount, but it's still enough of an amount to, to make a difference. We need to kind of compensate for that. So I can click on kerf here and I can tell it what the kerf of my laser is. Now I know that the kerf of my laser is 0 0.1. <clears throat> so now it will kind of compensate for that in the in the design. So I'm going to download an, an SVG file. Click on download SVG. That's going to download the file to my to my computer here. <coughs> I'm just going to open up a window there, and, and then I'm going to open that up with Inkscape. <coughs> okay, so I just need to flick over to um, Inkscape. Okay, so here we go. Here's Inkscape. Um, let's make that a bit bigger. And kind of zoom that down a little bit. Um, I'll just change the view so that we can see it a bit better. Um, there we go. So there's my plans in Inkscape. Um, when it brings them in, it groups <coughs> all of the parts together. So what I want to do first of all is ungroup all of these parts. Now, I don't really need to have the, the labels on the, on the parts. I just need to know which ones they are. So the top one is the one I'm interested in <coughs> because I want to cut a hole in the top to make a slot um, to put the coins in. So I'm going to get rid of that. <coughs> and I'm going to... Um, get my box and I'm going to draw a little slot in the top here. Uh, oh. And I'm going to tell it that's millimeters. Uh, I'm make that less rounded. The corners. <coughs> I might round them a little bit. There we go. So now I have tools here built in that lets me kind of like align things. But for the moment, I'm just going to kind of eyeball this and just uh, make sure it's kind of roughly in the middle there. So there we go. That's my that's going to be my my plans for my box. I'm just going to save those. Save that down. Um, and then I'm going to switch over to my laser cutting software. So let's just switch into the laser software. So the laser cutting software is called um, LaserBox. And I can import that SVG file and open that up, load that in. So there is my plans for my box. Um, so what I'm going to do is just <coughs> go down to the laser cutter and put the, the sheet of plywood in the machine. So one sec. <coughs> now our laser cutter um, has a feature built in whereby if we put some material into the laser cutter, um, it can kind of automatically uh, scan the, the barcode that's on the material and set the right settings for the, uh, for the, for the material. So 
and then we have a camera built into the uh, the lid of of the laser cutter so i'm actually looking straight down onto onto the material that i've just put in the laser cutter um so i can position position my position my uh my drawing exactly where i want it on the sheet of plywood um, so once that's done all i need to do is hit the start button and <coughs> it estimates how long it's going to take to um just to cut out the file and then i just have to um send that across to the uh to the laser cutter and hit send and then i just press the button on the laser cutter and it will start cutting out so that says it's going to take five minutes to cut out so while that's on that's going i'll just uh, switch back and carry on it's going to be a bit annoying in the background there while it's cutting out um, okay so moving on from subtractive manufacturing to additive manufacturing so basically um where subtractive manufacturing starts off with a block of something or a sheet of something and cuts away what we you know don't need to leave behind what we do need additive manufacturing starts off with a raw material and rebuilds our model um from from the ground up basically um so there's much less waste with additive manufacturing than with subtractive manufacturing um because you're you're not having to throw anything away you're going to be starting off with a raw material and and building it up from scratch um so obviously one of the main technologies for additive manufacturing is is 3d printing um and 3d printing is rendering a 3d computer model into a physical form now there's lots of different types of 3d printing um so i guess the one of the most common ones is what we what we call fdm printing fused deposition modeling that that uses a plastic filament um so um a reed of plastic like this um this is this is 3d printer filament um it comes in a roll so that's your raw material it's very much like streamer wire um i'll explain why that term is used uh, later on um but it's effectively it comes as a roll of plastic like this a roll of uh, plastic wire or filament like that it's fed into your um fed into your machine and it melts the plastic and rebuilds the model for you um the other type of 3d printing is sla which is called stereolithography apparatus um that uses a liquid plastic resin so it comes literally as kind of like a a, a gloopy plastic um, resin and the model is is made by firing either a laser or uv light at the resin which then hardens um as as the light or the laser hits it and um and then the model is made again layer by layer by layer um the other type of um 3d printing is what's called sls which is called selective laser sintering so again instead of starting off with either a, you know a filament or a resin this starts off with a powder um, so it's sort of powdered plastic um, and then a laser is fired at it and it traces out the shape of the of the um of the part layer by layer again and builds up the model um, the other type 
then you get is direct metal laser sintering. So that starts off with a metal powder. So you can actually 3D print in metal. Um, and again, it kind of melts, melts the metal powder. So it, it creates a model um, layer by layer. And then the last one, which is called multi, multi fusion jetting or poly jetting, sometimes it's called, um, that can use kind of mixed materials. So you can, um, you can have plastics or ceramic or rubber, and you can usually mix two materials together. So if you, if you say you have a, a model where you need like a, a solid handle with a, you know, maybe with a flexible rubber top on it or whatever, um, you can actually 3D print using two different materials and have them kind of mixed, mixed together to create one part. Um, so as, as we go down this list, we, we're, going, we're going up in price all the time. So from FDM machines um, that start around 150, um, 150 euros, all the way up to these polyjet machines that cost, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of euros. Okay, so the um, the laser cut is finished there. So I'll just go and grab the uh, the parts and show you. Okay, so here we go. So here is the um the piece of uh plywood so that's essentially the the waste material you know i, I still have a bit of uh you know spare bit of wood there that i might be able to use but essentially that now is is kind of you know waste material um so i, I have the parts here all the different parts of the uh the money box and there's my there's my lid uh, with the, the slot cut out on it. So with them, um, dropped a bit down here. So with laser cutting, because because it's so precise, um, let's try and let's try and fit some of these parts to the base here. Um, what we can do is the parts usually fit together fairly snugly once you get them once you get them together so, which way around does that go let's go around there it's like a 3d jigsaw puzzle so as i'm fitting these parts together um they're kind of slotting together quite nicely um well, maybe not quite so nicely this time. So there you go. They kind of holds together like like that. You maybe need a little bit of glue just to glue those together. But the precision of, of the laser is, is quite good so that you can actually hold them together. Um, I'll show you another one that I made made earlier. Here's, here's one I made earlier in true Blue Peter fashion. Um, there's no glue on that one at all. That one, that one is actually held together just by by friction, friction fitting. Um, okay, let's go back to the presentation. Um, so let's talk about um, FDM printing. Um, so fused deposition modeling. Um, what does that mean? So basically what we're talking about is um, taking a material, which is our, our, our filament, um, depositing it onto a print bed, you see over here on, on the right hand side, and heating up that filament so that it fuses together and it creates our model. So that's fused deposition modeling. Um, like I say, this is the most common type of kind of low cost 3D printers, the most widely used. Um, and it actually has the most kind of wide variety of plastics and composite materials on offer. So, um, you know, this type of filament here 
you know, comes in like a multitude of colors and a multitude of kind of finishes. Um, you have like, you know, glossy finish, matte finish. You have kind of silk-like finishes, sparkly, glow in the dark. Um, you can even get filaments that um, have wood um, kind of chips in them um, so that when you 3D print with them, they actually look like kind of wooden models. You can get carbon fiber. You can get um, three, 3D filament, 3D printing filaments that have um, metal in them, so sort of copper and brass, um, that when you take them off the print bed, you can actually um, sort of bake them in an oven and they, they turn into sort of almost solid metal objects. So the, the kind of where the real kind of um, innovations are happening in this type of 3D printing are, are in the kind of materials that are, that are, that are available. Um, I'm just going to show you a little video here on five reasons why you might want to uh, consider 3D printing for your, uh, um, for your designs. So let's just find that one. Here we go. We're discussing five reasons you should consider 3D printing your design. Now this video is aimed more at an industrial level rather than hobbyist because I'm assuming if you already own a low cost 3D printer, you're probably gonna find any excuse to 3D print on it. But if you don't and you have a design that needs to be produced as a product or similar, I'm gonna go through in this video five reasons you should consider 3D printing as a viable route. And then in the next video, we're gonna discuss five reasons why you probably shouldn't consider 3D printing. Let's get started. Okay, reason number one, 3D printing is faster than traditional manufacturing. And this is true. If you wanna go down the traditional manufacturing route to manufacture a product, it will take drastically more time than 3D printing a single object because tooling takes an awful long amount of time versus 3D printing where you can just produce one object overnight. Now that's not to say that 3D printing is faster than mass production, but it becomes ready quicker. You can just produce one object on a 3D printer overnight, whereas with injection molding, for example, you need to do the, your tooling and get it up and running, which takes a very long time. But then once it is up and running, you can produce parts very quickly. Reason number two, you might want to consider 3D printing for your product. It has little to no geometric limitations. Now, some objects are very, very complex. And really, there's not many other ways you could manufacture them than 3D printing. Remember, 3D printing is a layer by layer process. It's otherwise known as additive manufacturing and doesn't have any inherent geometric limitations that other more traditional manufacturing processes might which is why you're seeing many aerospace companies now adopting 3D printing in metal for end use parts because they can get the weight down while maintaining strength, all due to the fact that they don't have to adhere to the same geometric limitations that they did in the past. Reason number three, it's cheaper than mass production, but only if you want a certain number of parts. Again, we're talking about comparing to injection molding. With 3D printing, getting one or two or three is much lower cost than producing a tool for injection molding. Now that tool might be useful for producing hundreds of thousands of identical parts, but if you don't want that many, it's a wasted sunk cost. And again, it will take a very long time to get you there. So 3D printing in the early stages of product development is far more cost effective than going through tooling and producing mass production molds and producing parts that way. 3D printing also generally is cheaper than CNC processes where you might start with metals and subtractively machine them away. 3D printing tends to be a bit cheaper than those processes. Reason number four, you might wanna consider 3D printing for your design. You're still designing it. Uh, I, I've sent, said in previous videos that design is iterative and when you're still working on a product and you're not sure it's gonna be ready or perfect, you still wanna test it. You can't just get it right first go, it never happens. So if you're not ready, to commit to a large production run of a part that may or may not be wrong, it's happened before, it's destroyed companies, 3D printing is your surefire bet of testing. That's why it's otherwise been known as rapid prototyping. You are rapidly prototyping your design and product. And if something's wrong, 
it's not going to be at the end of the world. You can go back and test it. And again, taking advantage of the short lead time with 3D printing, get it right before you commit to a larger batch of objects. And finally, reason number five, you might want to consider 3D printing for your product. It's decentralized. So what does that even mean? Well, every 3D printer is like its own little, little miniature factory. And these could be anywhere in the world. And you can distribute the files that these machines take online digitally, which means you can have a product and send it to anyone in the world with a 3D printer and they can reproduce that product. Now there is different technologies and different you know, qualities you can get off different 3D printers, but the, the root file, the STL file is universal between all these machines. So if you have a product that you want to share with the world, again, like open source, this is a big thing for open source, you can share the blueprints, you can share the STL files, and because 3D printing is decentralized, anyone in the world can reproduce that object. You can't really stop it. Again, my, one of my favorite ever quotes, you can't stop the signal. You can't control it. 3D printing is decentralized. And that's gonna do it for this video of five reasons you should consider 3D printing for your product or... Okay, so there we go. That's uh, Angus from uh, a YouTube channel called Maker's Muse. Um, highly recommend you check that out. Um, he uh, does lots of videos on 3D printing and on laser cutting and sort of like digital design in general. Um, okay, let's switch back to the presentation. Here we go. Um, so as I was saying, um, with 3D printing, you know, it's becoming much more industrialized and um, there's some links here. I mean, Angus mentioned it in his, uh, his presentation about the aviation industry using it to create, you know, parts for, for planes and jet engines because of, you know, the inherent kind of geometric advantages it, 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 gives, it gives them. Um, also, in, you know, for industrial commercial building, we get 3D printers now that can actually 3D print concrete. They can actually 3D print a house in you know a matter of days rather than months so you know it's speeding up um the sort of like the the manufacturing process um and then there's a few interesting experiments in 3d prototyping here I, i've given you a few links there for you to, to have a look at um later on um so moving on to sla um so stereolithography like I was saying, this uses a liquid plastic resin or what's called a photopolymer um, because it's a, it's a plastic polymer that's sensitive to light. Um, SLA was actually the first ever 3D printing technology that was invented, um, but it's only now becoming mainstream, um, mostly because of um, patents, and um, also because that the um, the cost of the you know the the lasers or the or the the, the UV lamps that were needed um, were quite expensive, but those you know due to sort of like you know mass production have come down in price quite a lot. The great thing about um, SLA is it produces very accurate and detailed models. The, the, sort of the resolution on, on, on the models is, is absolutely astonishing. The sort of like the fine detail that you can get on the models is really astonishing. The downside is that they're very messy to use and clean up because you are dealing with kind of liquid goop that is, um, you know, sometimes quite toxic and uh, gives off nasty smells. Um, and when the part comes off of the, 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 the print bed, um, it needs to be kind of cleaned up and cured and um, sort of washed in alcohol and things like this. So um, it's not as easy to sort of like do as FDM printing, you know, when you're, you know, when you're, when you're, um, taking a, a, a print off of the, the bed of a 3D, you know, an FDM 3D printer. Once it's done, it's done, you lift it off and there's your, you know, there's your model done. Um, so S SLA is great on detail, but there is a bit of an overhead in terms of sort of like the, the, 
the time required. I'm just going to again play you a little video of uh, Form Labs. This is the Form 3 3D printer, one of the first kind of like um, mainstream uh, desktop SLA printers. Um, let's go and find that. Um, share. Here we go. Um, no, the one. Let's go back here. Try that again. Okay. Hey there, I'm Adam, and I'm part of the team that created the Form 3. The Form 3 is a part of a 3D printing ecosystem that is super easy to learn and use and requires little user intervention or maintenance. Today, we're gonna to cover the basics of how to use the Form 3, from the software and materials to printing and post-processing. With the new advanced low force stereolithography technology behind the Form 3, we have completely re-engineered resin-based 3D printing to deliver incredible part quality and printer reliability, giving anyone from individual designers to large production teams, the ability to bring their ideas to life with more quality and reliability. Let's get going. The latest version of our preformed software makes printing on the Form 3 as seamless as possible. It makes 3D print setup, management, and monitoring simple. To start printing, first, export your design as an STL or OBJ file from your favorite CAD software. Open the file in preform, our free and easy to use software tool that prepares your design for 3D printing. Formlabs offers a wide variety of 3D printing resins formulated specifically for our printers, including general purpose standard resins and specialty materials for engineering, dental, jewelry, and more. Choose your desired layer thickness. A higher setting, like 100 microns, will lead to faster printing, while lower settings, like 25 microns, offer the best surface detail. Use one-click print to automatically set up supports layout, and orientation in one step. Make advanced manual adjustments, such as support size, density, and position as needed. Once your print is ready, send it to the printer via USB, Ethernet, or Wi-Fi. You can also upload to a primed printer via the cloud with remote print, allowing you to work anywhere, anytime. During printing, the online dashboard allows you to monitor print progress and check material supplies effectively managing a fleet of printers and users across multiple locations. Once uploaded, you're ready to print. The Form 3's versatile cartridge and tank system allows you to easily change materials without having to handle resin. Before starting the print, make sure the build platform, resin cartridge, and resin tank are ready inside the printer. Unless you change materials, you'll only need to set them up once. The Form 3's resin cartridges and build platform are the same as those used with the Form 2. The resin cartridge is part of our hassle-free resin system that automatically senses the resin level and fills the tank as you print, so your print won't be interrupted. The Form 3 resin tank, which makes up the print surface, features a strong, flexible film held in tension. This cutting-edge technology reduces the force on your part during the peel process to produce detailed parts with smooth surface finish. To minimize user error, the Form 3 will automatically sense when everything is inserted correctly and you're ready to start a print. Many sensors integrated throughout the printer help maintain ideal print conditions and send you alerts about print progress and the state of your machine. And once you press print, you can just leave the printer to complete the print so you can go focus on other work. After the print is finished, there are three main steps in post-processing stereolithography parts. Rinsing an IPA, not the beer, isopropyl alcohol, the removal of supports, and post-curing. Formlabs has made each of these steps as easy as possible to save you time and increase your throughput. To rinse your part, insert the build platform directly into the form wash after printing for a consistent, automatic rinse. The Form 3's light touch supports are designed to tear away with ease, leaving behind minimal support marks for easier post-processing. Depending on the model and the material, 
you may want to remove supports before or after post cure. Next, transfer the part to our automated post curing station, the Form Cure. Form Cure includes custom settings that maximize mechanical properties for each Formlabs material. Consistently produce high quality results with less time and less effort with the complete end to end Formlabs ecosystem. The Form 3 built on advanced low-force stereolithography technology is the next step towards universalized... Okay, so there we go. That's uh, the Form Labs Form 3 stereolithography. Um, as you can see, they've tried to make the whole um, process of uh, using a, an SLA printer very easy by having these cartridges. Um, but a lot of the kind of lower cost um, SLA machines, you can actually get a, a, a desktop um smaller version of this um from a chinese company for about 300 euros um but you will be sort of pouring bottles of of liquid resin into uh into containers um so it's it's not quite as quite as easy okay let's switch back to the uh back to the presentation um so I'm just going to give you a rapid history of rapid prototyping. <laughs> um, so the the ability to kind of like create models out of 3D quickly um, isn't a new isn't a new thing. Um, back in the 18 at the 1860, um, Francois William um, created this idea of the photo sculpture, um, and he took what was a new technology at the time, which was uh, photography. And he set up uh, a room, a round room with cameras positioned around the room in kind of a 360 degree uh, uh, sort of uh, um, circle. And the subject that, that he wanted um, stood in the middle. He took photographs of them standing still from all the different different angles and was able to create effectively the first kind of like 360 degree photograph so you know you may think 360 degree photos on facebook are are, are, are a new thing but um he was doing this back in uh, in 1860 what he would then do because he was a sculptor and the uh, the final product here was going to be a, a a sculpture of of the the person um he would project, replace the cameras with projectors and project the photographs onto a, uh, a block of marble. And in that way, it would create effectively a, 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 like a, almost a, a hologram, a three-dimensional three image uh, projected onto the marble that he was then able to use to, um, to sculpt and uses a guide to sculpt um, and create create his his sculptures. Um, the the beauty of this system was he was he was able to kind of create sculptures of of um, of, of people again and again because all he had to do was put a new block of marble in in the middle, project the images again, and he could you know kind of cre keep creating sculptures. Um, from from those you know sort of like set of images um so that was kind of the first use of of kind of like you know 3d to kind of rapidly prototype um you know sort of sculpture um so moving forward into uh, into um the uh, 20th century um hideo kodama um was the first person to actually um sort of um theorize about a, a, a working sort of photopolymer rapid prototyping system. So something that we would know as like a, an SLA system today with, with, you know, liquid, liquid plastic. So he, he published the first account of one. Unfortunately, he couldn't get the funding he required um, to develop it further. So it never really went beyond being a sort of like a, a theoretical thing. Um, then moving forward to 1984, um, Charles Hull, or Chuck, as he's like 
likes to be called Chuck Hull, the founder of 3D System. Um, it sort of invents what we would know as you know modern stereolithography. Um, basically, take a 3D model and then use a U UV laser to kind of etch it into a, a liquid plastic or a photopolymer. Um, and he developed you know a number of kind of machines and sort of marketed them as as industrial 3D printers. And he acquired the patent on SLA technology. Um, in 1987. Now, if you if you have Netflix, um, there is a really fascinating um, documentary on Netflix called Print the Legend, which kind of like explores the uh, the patent right um, and uh, and is kind of like a bit of a industrial um, industrial espionage kind of story between um, 3D systems and form labs and MakerBot and a lot of the sort of like the early, um, you know, 3D printer manufacturing companies. So it's a, it's a really fascinating kind of documentary. So I recommend checking that out. Then moving forward again, um, 1991, um, Scott Crump, that's him over there on the right, um, of Stratasys produces the world's first um, FDM machine. So um, that's you know the machine that uses the uh, filament-based plastic. And like I say, in his original experiments in creating the FDM machine, he did actually use strimmer wire um, as uh, as his kind of like material when he was uh, testing out this uh, um, this idea. So this is obviously the technology that uses um, an extruder to, uh, you know, heat up the, the plastic and then just deposit it onto, onto the print bed layer by layer. Um, then moving forward again, 2005, the RepRap project was founded by Adrian Bowyer at the um, University of Bath in the UK. And the idea of that project was to try and democratize um, FDM printing. Um, Again, he, he, um, he Adrian Barrow sort of saw 3D printing technology, and and saw that it 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 could be used to you know have a machine make a machine, so you could 3D print the parts to um, make a 3D printer. He was interested in seeing how um, whether you know a machine made from a machine, whether the machines got better and better over time as as you sort of like created the parts for them. Um, so 2008 was his first um, 3D printer. Um, the Darwin, as it was called, the origin of the species, so to speak. Um, and, and there he is over on the left, um, the parent machine. So this machine 3D printed the parts to make this machine, the child machine. And, and, and there, there is, his first ever kind of Darwin machine, and all these parts here are sort of like the uh, that hold it together and and hold the extruder in and all that. They're all three D printed. Um, so then moving on and to twenty twenty, and the coronavirus sweeps the planet, and three um, D printing becomes a lifesaver for his for his ability to rapidly um, produce PPE. So um, Prusa. Uh, is a 3D printer manufacturer in uh, in the Czech Republic um, in Prague, and the uh, the owner of that, um, Joe Prusser, um, when the coronavirus um, started taking off and PPE was running short, he um, uh, put a, a design for a for a face shield uh, that could be 3D printed up on the Prusser website, and um, as um, as, as I was saying earlier about 3D printing being decentralized, you know, um, people could take those STL files and then start printing their own, um, you know, face shields all the way around the world. And this become, became, you know, uh, a way to kind of distribute um, plans and also to be able to make the necessary parts. So, so the picture in the middle here is, is that's the IT Sligo. They, um, They've got a bit of a production line going, making uh, face shields for local uh, nursing homes and the hospital. 
Um, again, Ward Automation in Sligo there, um, we're using their um, <clears throat> their industrial machines to sort of like make the, the PPE as well, the face shields. Um, so it has become a bit of a, a you know, um, a news story um, as to how quickly, you know, by decentralizing the manufacturing, you can sort of like produce quite a, an amount of um, um, parts and, you know, products. So digital glue, um, basically what we're talking about here is, is taking the entire design process as a digital workflow. And the thing that holds this together as you move from one application to another, to another, to another, um, is what we call the digital glue, which is these interchangeable file types and standards um, that, we meant, that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, that allow all these kind of disparate machines to kind of understand each other. And the thing that kind of holds a lot of it together is this thing called G-Code, which was invented by MIT, um, who started, you know, the whole Fab Lab movement. But MIT actually invented the first um, uh, CNC machine back in the 1950s. And to get that CNC machine to move, and actually uh, create parts, they had to actually create the code um, that, that it used to work on. And, and that is G code. And G code pretty much remains um, the code that all CNC machines use to this day. There was a, a kind of an update of it in the 1970s developed by the US Air Force, um, which was called STEP. Um, and that allowed sort of more sophisticated um, data to be um, incorporated into the files. So G-code was literally just, you know, move, you know, X millimeters to the right, move X millimeters to the left and move X millimeters down. And, you know, it was very much just kind of like a positional data, whereas STEP incorporated sort of like um, information about the type of machine that it may be coming from and going to. So it kind of adds in a sort of a, a you know, a, a layer of what we call metadata, sort of data that it explains about the data. Um, and again, STEP is kind of used um, to this day. So when we're talking about like the, this, this kind of digital digital workflow or digital pipeline. Um, you have these terms CAD, CAM, and, and K. Um, so CAD is computer-aided design, sometimes called computer-aided drafting as well. Um, that's the actual you know, design software that you use to you know, either create your 2D or your 3D designs. And then you have what's called CAM, which is computer-aided manufacturing. Um, so this is sort of like, the bit that bridges the gap between the machines and and the, and the actual you know CAD uh, designs themselves, and then somewhere sort of in between all that, you have what's called um, computer aided engineering, um, and this has become much more uh, sophisticated in recent years. You know, with um, you know, with has processor, you know, power increases and, you know, has, you know, memory becomes, you know, faster. Um, you can do a lot more of the kind of engineering in software that you'd have to kind of typically do, um, you know, in the real world. So looking at this kind of process here, you have a design process where you start off with your, you know, CAD program to do your part design and then you can join those parts together to sort of maybe create a digital mock-up. So, um, you know, a fully realized, you know, product say, um, and then you can use your CAD to also, you know, then create your photo realistic renders of your model. So, um, you know, they're sort of like these fantastic, um, you know, with fantastic lighting and the, the materials all, um, uh, beautifully uh, rendered. And then you have the uh, the computer-aided engineering coming in, 
where you can take that product and um and analyze it for certain things like you know if you drop it will it shatter if you bend it will it break and you can apply all these kind of like stresses and um and forces to a digital model to see how it will actually you know react in the real world which then allows you to sort of go back to the design process and sort of like re-engineer it if it, it fails any of those things then you bring it on and you create your your cam your compute rated manufacturing so your cnc tool path um, again as we saw in the video earlier where he creates his tool path in the software to cut out the the, the lid of the, the the box and then on from that you can create your use your cad drawing to create your engineering drawing so you know these are the kind of like you know the ikea style exploded um drawings of your 3d thing to see how maybe you know maybe your part is a is a flat pack and it has to be bolted together you can create those kind of engineering drawings from your from your cad uh, to show someone you know how something needs to be you know actually put together so all of this can happen digitally and it's only when it goes from the cam to the actual machine are you actually you know going into the real world um so when we're talking about cad um obviously the various various levels of cad um for the beginner one of the best places to start is, is with um um some online tools so basically these are kind of browser-based apps that are kind of free to use all you need to do is kind of sign up create an account um tinkercad is probably one of the most well known um it's actually created by by autodesk um and it's their kind of like very kind of beginner level um you know entry package that you know you'd used you know for maybe school children to start learning 3d modeling um but actually i know quite a lot of um <laughs> professional designers that will kind of start off in tinkercad um to uh, very quickly kind of throw together some you know um models that they may then bring on later on um 3d slash is another one this is usually kind of minecraft style modeling um where you kind of like building blocks up to create your model and then there's a another one you may have heard of called sketchup um sketchup was actually started by by google and then it sort of branched off into its own own company they have a a free version of sketchup um that you can actually use again it all just runs in a browser um and if you kind of like like using that and want to kind of move on then they have a, a, a like a a paid version of that you can install on on your computer um so there's three there that are kind of um easy to kind of use and get started with i'll just give you a quick demo of tinkercad just to show you exactly what it is um that that you can do with it if i just share my screen here and just go into tinkercad so um here's tinkercad um so when you get to the website this is what you see if you want to create an account you click on join now and uh, you can create your own personal account um like i say all they want is your your email address um i'm just going to sign in with my account um here we go sign in so when, once you sign in to tinkercad you'll be into what's called the the tinkercad dashboard where all of your previous designs live tinkercad doesn't save anything onto your computer it saves everything up in the cloud um and you don't actually you have to remember to kind of save as you go along because again tinkercad kind of like, like kind of google docs it just kind of saves everything um automatically for you so i'm just gonna go into this demo file here that i've created so when you get into tinkercad you're presented with this um this kind of like uh interface um 
when using CAD programs, you're always better to use a three button mouse. That's a, you know, that's a mouse with a, a scroll wheel in the middle. Um, the reason for that is you can use the, 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 the extra buttons on the mouse to kind of navigate around. So I'm just holding down the right mouse button and that lets me sort of navigate around um, what's called orbit, turn around. Uh, and then I can use a scroll wheel to kind of zoom in and out. And then I can also hold down the scroll wheel button to kind of pan backwards and forwards and, and, and up and down. So with those three buttons, you can kind of pretty much do whatever you really want to do. If you get totally lost, you can just uh, click the home view button. The way Tinkercad works is you have a, a it's what's called a solid modeler. Um, because you start off with these kind of, you know, solid shapes over here and you create your models from them. So I'm just going to quickly kind of knock together uh, uh, an egg cup. Uh, very simple design. So I'm going to start off with a cone um, as the as the base of the egg cup. Um, as you kind of like, you can drag and drag out shapes to create, you know, whatever size you want. You can actually also type in the dimensions you want as well. So if I want that to be 30 by 30, I can make that 30 by 30 and 30 by 30 by 30. Uh, I'm going to grab a cylinder. I'm going to make that. Um, 10 by 10. Uh, I'm going to put that there. I'm going to make that a bit taller. There we go. And then I'm going to grab a sphere. Um, now I'm going to just zoom in here and uh, pan over. Um, to get this up on top of the uh, thing there, to make the kind of cup of the egg cup, the one thing I need to do is just turn it around. So you have these little um, arrows here that let you kind of navigate and turn things around. Uh, so we're going to turn it up upside down, 180 degrees. And then to, to actually move move it up in the air, there's a see this little cone here. It lets me kind of like move it up and down off of the off of the bed. So I'm just going to zoom out. I'm just going to move that up and move that over. I need to move it up a little bit more. So I move it up about like that. And probably going to need to make that a bit bigger as well. Maybe make that 30 by 32, oh, 30 by 30. Um, and maybe make it a bit taller. So there we go. Just zoom around and look at that. Um, that's fine, except I need to kind of create the, the hole for the... Uh, the egg cup. So what I'll do is I'll just duplicate that. And one thing I can do, you see over here at the moment, it's a solid shape. But what I can do is I can actually make it into a hole. I can actually make it um, turn into um, a hole. And then if I make this a bit smaller, say I make that uh, 25 by 25 like that. Um, and I can move that roughly into the middle, sort of. What I can do now is just select all of these, and I can I can align them all, so sort of align them to the center of each other. So there's a hole in the middle of that, but to actually make make the hole a you know render the hole, I'll have to group them together. Once I group them together, I just change the color just so you can make, see it a bit easier. Um, so there we go. So there's a little design for, say, an egg cup. It's very easy. So say I wanted to send that off to the 3D printer. Um, to print, all I need to do is click on the export button. And then I can just click on STL. That will download an STL file for me um, that I can then send off to my 3D printer. So that's kind of, you know, the basics of Tinkercad. You've got a whole load of um, different kind of shapes here. You can actually um, have different um, part libraries as well. Um, I mean, you can actually generate your own shapes as well. There's a, the ability to kind of like create a, a create your own shapes. So if there's a particular shape you want, so you want to know kind of like a, a 
bell shape or whatever hair shape you can you can actually go in and draw your own shape um and then click done and then you've, you've generated your own shape and you can then go and you know change that however you want really um so there is the ability to kind of like you know custom generate shapes in in tinkercad which makes it quite quite easy you know um so that's tinkercad so i'll leave that there and we'll go back to the presentation so moving on so entry level using some of the online cad tools is a good way to kind of get started if you've never used uh, cad before and um, then moving up to kind of mid-level you've got um autodesk fusion 360. um fusion 360 is a much more sophisticated cad package but it kind of builds upon the kind of uh, interface that you'd find in tinkercad and just adds in a lot more um features uh to it um and they keep adding more and more stuff to fusion 360 so it now has um a lot of that kind of computer aided manufacturing um and the kind of computer aided engineering stuff so you can do the kind of like stresses and all that kind of stuff within fusion um so you know it, it can take you from sort of like you know basic you know mid-level up to kind of like pro level really um other packages sort of worth mentioning are autodesk mesh mixer again that's that's free to use mesh mixer allows you to kind of like take um existing um say um 3d models or stl files and kind of like sculpt them using kind of sculpting tools um, um, if you kind of think of it like kind of photoshop for um for 3d files really is what mesh mixer is you know um whereas you might take a photo bring it into photoshop and you know tweak the colors and you know enhance certain things you can do the same kind of idea with mesh mixer uh, with 3d files um rhino cad is again a very uh, accomplished sort of 3d um, modeling package um that you know if you um seem to use it quite a lot um in europe it seems to be um very well you know well used and well liked you know uh, in european countries um blender is a is another um 3d package that is free and also open source so it open source means it's sort of developed by a community of, of, of de developers and users blenders more used for kind of like doing 3d animation so if you need to create uh, like a, a 3d animation um a la kind of pixar type you can use blender um to create that so i'm just going to quickly jump into fusion 360 and just give you a quick quick look at fusion 360. um so what i can do is um if i'm going to quickly go back to um to, to to tinkercad one thing you can do with tinkercad if you if you've got your 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 3d model in tinkercad um you can send that model to fusion 360 so you can start modeling in, in tinkercad and then bring it on to fusion 360 so i can click here and i can say open in fusion 360 and and hopefully it should <laughs> there we go uh, open in fusion 360 okay i'm just going to switch over to fusion 360 and show you that um, let's jump into fusion okay so here we are in fusion 360 so there's the model that i that i started in in tinkercad um and again i'm just using the same kind of mouse controls the right button to sort of like navigate around zoom the scroll wheel to zoom in um 
So, like I say, this is a good way, you know, of, of starting something in one online and then bringing it into another one. So, the kind of extra things I can do in in infusion would be things like um, kind of smooth this model out. So, I want to sort of make this look about much more kind of sculptural. So, what I can do is I can, you know, kind of fill it. Um, fill it the design here and I can um, kind of like you know um, go and so maybe make that maybe make that say 10 and and that kind of smooths that out again I can do the same down here down the bottom and just kind of like drag that in make that a bit more sculptured like same here sort of fill it fill it the edge here just kind of you know drag that down maybe make the the edges of of the uh, of the egg cup again not quite so sharp just make it a bit more sculpted um like that so there we go so now i've kind of like you know just altered the design slightly but made it much more kind of like sophisticated looking um design and then one thing I can do then is um, uh, maybe if I say I wanted to render this out as a as a as a picture that I could then send off to somebody um, to uh, to to um, to look at, I can go in here and I can go appearance, um, and I have all different kinds of you know uh, glass or you know, metal. So say I would say I want them, you know, have this machined from uh, aluminium, you know, um, I can give it a kind of a rough, rough look and I can just grab that like that. And then I could um, render that, go into my render workspace and and it creates a nice kind of like photorealistic render of of my of my object. Um, I can click render. Um, oh, I've got to save it first. Save that. Save. Okay, and then render. Um, so the rendering is all done again up in the cloud. Um, a lot of these programs use kind of cloud computing to do all the kind of like really heavy, heavy list, you know, lifting um, to try and to, to render designs. Um, I can I can see um, down the bottom here. Once it's finished rendering, it'll put it into my my render gallery, and I'll be able to download that picture. Um, so yeah, so that's that's. That's uh, Fusion 360. Um, so I'll just again flick back to the presentation. There we go. Um, okay, so then moving up to the sort of like the, the, the top level um, of CAD programs, there's FreeCAD. Um, as it says in the name, it's free. Um, again, it's kind of an open source package developed by you know a whole group of uh, developers around the world. FreeCAD is very very deep in terms of like the the the, the features and functionality. Um, quite quite a steep learning curve to learn that one. Um, the one that um, is used a lot in industry is SolidWorks. And SolidWorks is actually taught in um, second and third level in the Irish curriculum. So if you, you know, if you're studying um, engineering or if you're studying um, um, technical graphics um, for a leaving cert or whatever, then SolidWorks is the program that you will that will that you'll be taught. Um, and again, it's like I say, it's, it has all of those um, CAD, CAM, and you know, computer aided engineering. Um, stuff built built into it. So again, it's 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 a it's a kind of immense package to learn. But again, um, like Fusion three hundred and sixty, 
just to get started modeling with it you know it is is quite easy and then you can sort of like start delving into the sort of deeper aspects of it um autodesk do uh, another level again above fusion 360 which is autodesk inventor um that that has a lot of um um <clears throat> extra kind of stuff in terms of the manufacturing side of things um, and developing kind of like um, process if you're working in a design team and you need to sort of like farm out certain aspects of the design to different designers you can all be working on one design but in a kind of like a design environment and that's what inventor does for you um, and then you have um, autocad and then there's one called um, open scad um, which is a kind of programmable CAD. So if if you're using CAD to kind of create um, um, sort of simulation models um, for kind of you know real real high end engineering, you can you can use Open SCAD to do some of that kind of work for you. Um, so we have an STL file that we've downloaded. Um, how do we actually get that out into our 3D printer? Well, we need to use something called a, a slicer. Uh, and uh, the picture of the egg slicer there um, uh, isn't by mistake, because essentially that is what a, the, the slicer does to your 3D model. It effectively slices it up into, uh, into various layers like that, um, which you can then send over to your 3d printer and it'll rebuild them um so the kind of um de facto um industry standard is um is cura um cura was was made by ultimaker um and ultimaker um make 3d printers um uh, that's the 3d printer i have i have here in the fab lab um and they created their own slicing software to go with their 3d printers what they did then was they they open sourced that software to allow other 3d printer manufacturers to um create plugins so it can be used with their their 3d printers um so here i can say has become kind of like the de facto industry standard for for, for slicing um, there are other slices. There's one called Simplify 3D. That is actually a, a kind of like a a, a paid for um, program. Cost about 100 euros, so it's quite expensive. Um, but it does have quite a lot of advanced features. Um, I would I would maybe use Simplify 3D um, if there was particular um, design that's quite complicated and they needed to have very kind of like um, uh, minute control over certain aspects of how things get printed um so it's it's one it's one option so i'll just give you a quick um again a quick uh, demo of cura and uh, and how we help uh, you how, how we do that um let's go here find cura <coughs> um there's cura Bear with me one sec. There it is, Cura. Here we go. Okay, so um, I'll just go over here. So basically, Cura again gives you kind of a three D um, environment. That's that's the bed of the three D printer. I can I can uh, import my uh, my three D model where is my 3d model there it is so there's my egg cup that we created in um in um tinkercad and um i can you know zoom in and look at it the red parts on the model there show me where um where the 3d printer is going to struggle to print because basically it's, it's overhanging. You see there in red, anything in red is an overhang. So what that means it's gonna be printing, but it's gonna be printing in, in, in thin air because there's nothing below it for the printer to print onto. Um, so 
what I might do is, you know, is is go back into <clears throat> the go back into Tinkercad or or into Fusion and maybe sort of like change the model so there's less of an overhang. Or one thing I can do then is maybe um, uh, generate some supports um, within within the uh, within the slicing program within Cura that will actually kind of hold up that model. Um, you kind of saw in the video for um, uh, form the form labs printer that they were putting supports on to hold up the the model while it was printing, and you can do the same thing in Cura here is generate those supports. Um, I'm not going to bother with that at the moment. Um, so coming over here onto the right hand side, this is where you kind of set up um the, the settings for how it's going to print and and the the main the main setting you're going to be concerned with is what's called your layer height which is how many slices it's gonna it's gonna slice your model up into um so <clears throat> so um it's done in kind of like you know points of millimeters so for <clears throat> you have like extra fine, fine, normal, and draft. Um, extra fine is 0 0.06 of a millimeter. So that's what's called 60 microns, um, all the way up to say 0.2, which is 200 microns. You can actually even go um, higher than that, which is 0 0.3. As you um, as you in increase the resolution, i.e., you go to finer layers, that increases the print time. Um, and the less amount of layers you create makes makes it go go quicker. So if all you want to do is create a very quick model, uh, quick print of your model, you can leave the layer height quite you know um, quite large, so that you can get a much quicker uh, print. Um, the the other thing that you need to concern yourself with is 3D printers never usually print models completely hollow, and they also usually never print models completely um, solid either. Um, usually, the inside of the models are printed, you know, semi-hollow, and you set that with this setting here called an infill. Um, so if I set the infill to zero, effectively that would make that hollow. It would just literally print the walls of the model and the inside would be hollow. Also, if I set it to 100%, that would then print that completely solid. Um, so we don't want to waste time and we don't want to waste plastic. But equally, we we don't want the model to be hollow, so that it's you know it's we could kind of break it like an eggshell. Um, so usually, you set an infill somewhere between ten and twenty percent. I'd maybe set this to say um, fifteen percent. Once we have that set, we can then click the slice button down the bottom here, and it goes and processes it, and it tells you how long it's going to take to print. So this is going to take thirty minutes. How much plastic? And if you told it the cost of your plastic, how much that's going to cost you. Um, we can then click on the preview button up here. And we can actually see all of our layers one by one. So this has 176 layers. And we can go from layer one all the way up, 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 up. And as you see inside the model, um, just turn that around a bit, zoom in. Um, there's there's the, the, the infill um that kind of like crisscross pattern in orange there is the infill um again if i change this say i change this to say uh 50 percent and then re-slice it uh, you notice the print time has gone up to 43 minutes but now the inside is a lot more there's a lot more detail on the on the on the fill on the inside there um, again if i change the layer height so say from 0.3 to say 0 
um, and hit slice. We had uh, 176 layers before, and now we've got 528 layers. So the resolution and the the quality of the the, the surface is going to be much finer. So we're not going to see that kind of like stepping um, pattern um, or the grain essentially of of, of the plastic. It's going to be much, much smoother finish, surface finish. Um, but again, the, the 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 print time has gone from half an hour to, to two hours. So we've, you know, we've uh, almost uh, quadrupled the amount of time it's taking us. Um, so once we have our um, model exactly as we like it in, in, the, uh, in the slicer, we can save that file um i'll save that onto the desktop there and you notice that it saves it as a g code file um and like i said i was saying earlier g code is that kind of code that mit invented back in the 1950s that, that all the cnc machines typically use to to control the machine so we'll save a g code file place that on a on a memory card into the 3d printer and it would print it out um, so that's the process there for for generating your your 3d printed files back to the uh, back to the presentation um, so uh, obviously creating your own designs in CAD is one way of, 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 of getting your uh, getting your model um, 3d printed uh, another way is to actually just go and look in one of the model libraries and find a design that you quite like and maybe um, um, use that as, as a starting point or using that as a sort of inspiration to, you know, modify or remix a design. Um, and there's lots of model libraries um, that you can go and look at. Um, Thingiverse, Umagin, um, Pinshape. Um, my mini factory, um, all of these have 3D models that, that people have, have put up um, that you can download for free um, and print out yourself. Some of them you can you can actually use and remix them to create your own models. So say you're looking for a particular you know part that you might want you know to go into your model or go into your design, you can use that and um and then to add it to your own design um by downloading it from one of these model libraries um also say you don't have a a 3d printer available to you um how do you get stuff printed or say you want to get something printed in a, a material that you know we can't print here at the fab lab um there are a lot of kind of online print shops um, I guess Shapeways would be the, the most uh, well known. Um, um, they, I think they have something like almost a hundred materials available uh, on their website that you can, you can print in. I mean, they, they have, you can print in gold and titanium and all these kind of like, you know, precious metals. Um, so effectively you have your model, you upload it to their website, you tell them you know what material you'd like it printed in you tell them you know how many you'd like one ten you know of them and they then send you a price on how much it'll cost you put your credit card details in and they print it for you and then ship you ship you the 3d print um so if you want to get something printed in, in, a, in a particular material or, or, or even kind of, you know, maybe printed in color because they have color 3D printers in shape ways, you know, you can you can get those done there. Um, a lot of these other websites, um, 3D hubs, as well as 3D printing, they can actually get stuff uh, injection molded. So you can send them your 3D model and they would actually go and create injection molds for your your model and, and get stuff injection molded so if you needed you know more of a you know more of a part um 
then you know say you wanted a hundred of something it's probably going to be more cost effective to get it um, um, uh, injection molded and that's where someone like 3d hubs can come in um, Pinoco um, don't necessarily do 3d they do do a bit of 3d printer but mostly they do um, either CNC or laser cut parts so if you need sort of like short run um, laser cut um, goods then they can they can do that for you and again they have a, a wide range of materials available that you can do it in um, but say you actually physically want to talk to somebody and not just have to deal through a website Here's a list of a few Irish prototyping uh, companies. Um, Neurotech are actually based in Sligo. Um, the guy that runs that um, used to um, work for um, Verus and work in the Innovation Center in Sligo. Um, and he has a whole kind of prototyping service. So you can take your model to him. He would be able to look at it and go, you know, well, we could, you know, we could 3D print that or we could, you know, um, uh, injection mold that. And he would be able to help get your your, your prototype into a kind of, you know, a, a kind of a, a ready, ready made product, um, ready for kind of mass marketing. Um, um, another company that's kind of I think they're based down in Galway, Alpha Precision, same kind of idea. You know, they, they take. They, they can take your design and sort of like um, analyze it um, for um, um, for kind of, you know, um, industrial um, development. And then there's a couple of other companies there. The, these are these these two are based up in Dublin, invent prototyping in key plastics. Again, they do similar kind of thing. Um, these two are kind of more locally based in the northwest. Um, these are kind of Dublin based. But again, if you want to actually physically talk to somebody um, uh, that's in the same country as you, then then this this is probably a, a good place to start with these guys. So um, that's kind of the end of the presentation, um, end of all the, the demos and stuff. So um, thanks for watching today. Um, it's a little bit of a different way of doing it today because the uh, original um, uh, live uh, stream that we did um, kind of didn't work out so I had to kind of record this again um, so hopefully it went okay for everybody and uh, thanks for watching um, next week Leo is going to be talking about um, sort of presenting your work and kind of funding opportunities and how to get things um, um, funded through various means sort of innovation vouchers, um, crowdfunding, um, and uh, sort of looking to sort of like design um, companies to maybe partner with. So that's for next, next week. So uh, again, thanks for watching.